And welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton, and together we will interview world leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence based. We are so thrilled to have Dr. David Hobbs join us on the podcast today. Welcome, David. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here this morning. Can't wait for this chat. Oh, we're really excited about this. <laughs> Super excited to talk to you today, David, um, mostly because you uh, come with such extensive experience in an area that is, you know, relatively novel to a lot of us, I think. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with David's work, he's a biomechanical engineer. So um, as we said, certainly a different perspective to a lot of us in this field. Um, David has extensive experience as a rehabilitation engineer in the field of disability, rehabilitation engineering and assistive technologies. He's currently a senior lecturer and academic staff member within the College of Science and Engineering and a researcher within the Medical Device Research Institute at Flinders University. Dr. Hobbs has quite the list of accolades, having been awarded a Churchill Fellowship, named Engineers Australia's Young Professional Engineer of the Year, and the Top 100 of Most Influential Engineers. He's worked across rehabilitation, engineering research and industry institutions all around the world, and has not once but twice won the College of Biomedical Engineers Better Technology Awards for Novel Assistive Technologies. On top of all of that, he's also an invited TEDx speaker, and has represented Australia at two Global Research Innovation and Education in Assistive Technology Summit events for the World Health Organization in Geneva. So as you can see and hear, he is quite the expert. (laughs) Thanks, Ash. That was definitely a mouthful, so thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) No problem. It's very impressive. It's been great. I've uh, I've, I've been lucky to have, and we talked about it earlier, a fantastic mentor. Uh, So, you know, mentors, I think, are really important people that you can bounce ideas off of. And um, definitely when they see opportunities that they think align with what you might want to do, it's just great having those people around you. Well, that's beautifully said. That's really important. Yeah. For sure. And, David, before we get uh, stuck into the specifics of of what we're going to cover today, um, For those who are regular listeners, you'll know that we do a little icebreaker to help us get to know each other a little bit better. Um, So we thought we'd start today with uh, a little icebreaker question, which is um, if, and excluding those of us with existing musical talent, if you could play any musical instrument uh, available to you, what would it be and why? So luckily I fit into the category where I've got no musical talent at all, so I can actually answer the question quite well. Um, I'm one of these people that uh, ever since I was young, I felt if I sat down in front of a piano, I felt that I could play it and that I should know how to play it, but I totally don't. So I would say I want to play the piano because I reckon it's a beautiful instrument and, uh, yeah, that would be my choice. Nice. I concur. The piano is a really beautiful instrument. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Dana, what about you? I know you already have quite a bit of uh, existing musical talent, but what would you what would you play if you could play anything oh, else? Look, so I will. I'm going to put it down to two things. One would be the harp. I love the idea of like seeing someone who's thinking about something. And I could whip out a harp and go and make that sort of you know the thinking noise as they're coming up with an idea. I just think that oh, would be yeah. brilliant. So that will be fun from that perspective. But when it comes to total fun, I look at the person who plays timpani in a symphony and I'm like, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just, the power and the strength of that, that would be lovely. So that would be me. I was going to say, I reckon the harp is a very underrated instrument, you know. It doesn't come up very often at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's all to all the people who do play harp out there. It's worth pursuing because it's a beautiful (laughs) instrument and you don't want to just put it together just in a little sort of sound, um, you know, sort of sound graphic that you could use. It's it's actually worthwhile playing and learning. So that's my take. Mm. (laughs) Ash, what about you? I'm keen to hear this one. Well, full disclosure, I... Play. I was a flautist for many years. I played Ooh. the flute in uh, the school band all through high school. So um, I was definitely one of the cool kids. Um, and Ooh. I, <laughs> I've always wanted to play the guitar. I, I again, oh. it's one of those things. I think I agree with you, David. I always looked at a guitar and thought, oh, I think, I think I could 
you know, do a, a, a good job of that if I just had the time and the, the patience to, to learn. Um, but then there's a little bit of me that loves the glory of a crash symbol. So um, <laughs> I think I could probably do a good job of that one with less practice. <laughs> And you get a gig every Christmas, right? Yeah. So there you go. Play the symbols every Christmas. For oh, sure. I love our ambition. And you can see with all of these instruments, the great thing about music is when you think about motor learning principles, it comes in. Like I used to teach piano and to all my students, my poor students, I'd be like, well, so now we need repetition and adequate repetition. So how's your practice been going? And your cerebellum, <laughs> your cerebellum needs to get all, all, this, all these skills and your visual motor coordination. Nation. Yeah, my, poor, my very poor students. But anyhow, I digress. <laughs> we have such an exciting topic to get into today. Um, as you've heard, Dr. David Hobbs' work is, is really quite different to a lot of the areas that we've been involved in, but the paths really do cross. And the two pieces of work that I really want to discuss with David today is to do with some of his work, as, as Ash had mentioned in the bio, with the work he had done with um, the World Health Organization and the, the summit meeting. So this was actually published in Disability and Rehabilitation in the Assistive Technology section titled Assistive Technology Products, a Position Paper from the First Global Research, Innovation and Education on Assistive Technology or the Great Summit. Um, and we want to also talk about that in the context of David's PhD, which was a randomized controlled trial on custom serious game systems with forced bimanual, forced bimanual use to improve upper limb function for children with cerebral palsy. And the reason why we thought this would be so great to talk about is we know that increasingly technology is a part of our lives. And, it, and when it comes to technology and how it's used within the context of rehabilitation, this area is growing really rapidly. And of course, within an industry that is continuously growing, research is really quite closely following that. So we may not always be able to access the results to what technology is doing in this space as they become commercially available. So it's really important that we realize that there is this potential gap between research and innovation and the knowledge that we get to then implement to the people that we get to work with. So when it comes to being evidence-based, we now need to really draw on what the evidence says are effective modalities and, and approaches. And our clinical expertise is really important here because we need to ensure that we're exercising discernment on what technologies we can use and how we can best benefit from them. And to be able to then discern which one we want to go for, because often technology is very expensive. So what can we draw on? As you've heard from our previous podcast, we've been talking about the principles of motor learning and, and this is relevant for any of us as therapists and occupational therapists, physios and speech pathologists. But we actually really do need a framework for how we use technology, which in our world in disability is called assistive technology. So further from this, there's also a need that we need to recognise the potential inequity of access to assistive technology that exists within our own country and across the globe. So to guide this discussion, we'll be talking about this position paper from the first Global Research Innovation and Education on Assistive Technology Summit, which really revolves around the five Ps, people, products, provisioning, personnel, and policy. And this will be a great guide to then talk about the piece of technology that Dr. David Hobbs was really instrumental in developing, that being the Orbit Gaming System. Thanks so much, Dana. And uh, I think, you know, given the the depth of this topic and I suppose the all the different really interesting conversation points around it uh David I wanted to start with something a bit higher level and if you could just for our listeners uh define I suppose the four uh different types of technology um that we talk about in that position paper so the the and the, and the roles that they have so uh we're talking about occupational environmental therapeutic and assistive technologies Yes, absolutely. And first of all, can I just say that uh, there's so much happening in this space at the moment. So I really do feel for people who don't really have a, a hawk eye on what's happening because once upon a time it was possible to be a, abreast of all the information and yeah. all the developments that are coming out. But in the same way that I see a lot of my colleagues on Twitter and in other um, 
either social media platforms or just at conferences, keeping up to date with data or information is extremely hard these days. Yeah. It's like that person on the beach trying to push the jellyfish back into the water and the ocean is just pushing it back <laughs> again. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this in the technology space is really been the development and the innovations around what we call generally the maker space. Yep. So the maker space of people who can apply their skills or apply their trade because they come from a technical background and you can actually start to put those out there mm. so people can see them. And, of course, once people see them, they want them. And then you start getting into pipelines and marketplaces yes. and innovations and things like that. Uh, so I think, first of all, I just want to recognise that it is a difficult space to keep up with. It really is. And then that whole innovation cycle is extremely hard as well. Uh, to take what is a, looks like a really good idea and then provide the evidence and the framework yeah. around it. So with Ash's fantastic introduction there, that you know those different categories, clearly there's, there's there are technologies for leisure, there are technologies for recreation, there are technologies for education. Uh, the assistive technology is, is part of the solution, and I think that's what I really want to get across so people, therapists know this. Uh, we know that a, a device will never replace the input that therapists have, it's part of the solution and you can't just give someone the product and say, there you go. Um, and I think making policy providers and funding bodies aware of that and aware of the fact that it's just part of the solution is also part of the story that we need to convey as well. If those devices then move into other areas such as uh, the therapeutic aspects and that's part of what we do with our gaming system, trying to actually provide with statistical evidence that we have a system and it has a therapeutic benefit again they need to make sure they go down this rigorous path and the words you're using before Dana with the introduction the evidence base yep. um, so you can actually prove it, I think is uh, critically important as well yeah and I think it's really worthwhile looking at the fact there are different types of technology they serve different purposes and it's to be clear about you know what it is that we're trying to do because you know we're talking so much about being really goal directed and and when it's goal directed therefore we need to know the purpose that we're trying to actually address are we supporting a person's ability to be more included or are we able to you know really enhance someone's functioning or is it to be for leisure and there's nothing wrong with that because we all enjoy that part of of what life is isn't it look absolutely a hundred percent and so when we think about assistive technology one of the really critical things and if we go back to say the hat model the human activity assistive technology model that cook and hussey put out uh -huh. there um the context is extremely important uh, so if i have a an aac device uh, if it's evoker a voice output communication aid you know when i use it in the classroom that's very different to when i go to the pub with my friends on a friday afternoon of course. Uh, because in a classroom it might be typically quietish a couple of voices maybe the teacher being the main voice and i'm using it for education and then i might be trying to discuss the footy game i see on the tv and of course a bar is very noisy so lots of ambient noise and so that role of that idea of context is extremely important. And, and, you know, we all deserve to have communication, mobility everywhere we go, not just to and from school or to and from the home. That's right. It's thinking about that broader picture, that real sort of live perspective. Um, and so from there, I want to talk a bit more about, you know, in this position paper, you do talk about what assistive technology is and what it aims to do in terms of enhancing functioning, not necessarily as a medical or health intervention. So there were some real clear points here with regards to what that means, but then there was this real blur of robotics and rehabilitation and therapeutic land. Can you sort of lay that out for us a little bit more so we can understand those differences? Yeah, and here now we're talking about, uh, you know, almost embryonic technology, aren't we, robotic technology. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm under the impression that this robotic technology came about, first of all, because robotics and technology were starting to really mature in this space. And if we're talking about some of the industries or um, the populations they started, such as, say, spinal cord injury. And so rather than having someone on a, a treadmill yep. um, and having therapists either side by manually, manually manipulating knee, ankle, et cetera, yep. there was definitely a place to see, well, hang on, uh, if a robotic device can do this, well, then potentially the robotic device could do that. And so you say, you know, manual labor, mm. back issues, <laughs> and in very, very tedious roles as well. Mm. Um, and so then it, comes to the situation of, well, then how can we find the evidence that this is better or, or just as good as what we used to do? Yeah. And then what are the realistic measures we have around that as well? So what are some of the, say, statistical measures or the MCIDs, so that clinical evidence yeah. that we know we're actually having a change as well? And, and that's been difficult. So if you look at some of the literature around, say, the Locomat device, which is probably the most well-known device in this space, 
Um, it, I think it is. I mean, I've uh, seen a local map being used. It was on actually on my Fulbright scholarship uh, in 2008 uh, at one of the Veterans Affairs Centres. And as an engineer, I was in awe. I have to say, <laughs> look, I mean, I'm, I'm a nerd, right? So, you know, seeing this, you know, robotic device, and there the person was hooked up in a sling, and the legs and the ankles and the hips and everything was going, yeah. and it was completely tethered. So that if the person tripped, then the travelator part of it would actually stop and lift them up so you wouldn't be injured any further. Mm. And, you know, just understanding the intelligence around that system and then the displays that you could interact with. So back in the day, you just saw what you're doing. Yeah. And we'll touch on this later on, but now they've gamified it. Yeah. So you can use the travelator gamify for more buy-in and motivation. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of any large meta-analysis which has proven a strong statistical significant improvement using devices, but it is showing efficacy in some places. Yeah. And it is showing that it does uh, address some of the motivational aspects. And if it is to get some of the motor patterns started and the movement happening, it does achieve in doing that. And I think that's a really important way that you said that because, of course, when I look at the locomat, you know, as a physio, so in a different lens to you, I'm like, it looks amazing and and it's beautiful. And this is what we were talking about before. We have this technology that has come to market. It looks really good, doesn't serve the purpose. And you're absolutely right in the sense that, uh, you know, there hasn't been great studies that have shown its effectiveness yet. And so we're probably a little bit, bit perplexed by that and kind of going, okay, so do we, do we go ahead and invest it and do that? Are there better ways of doing things? Because at the end of the day, it's still, you know, some, a, lot of, a lot of the time it's public money as well. So you do need to think about the efficacy and, and it's very similar. It's quite um, similar in the way to the first podcast that we did based on the study that I had done. It wasn't the Locomat, but the RT600. And we didn't find any additional benefit from using the RT600, but you're absolutely right. The motivational component, it definitely has feasibility, you know, and the gamification, those parts really do fit. And like you just said as well, it might be the start of a motor pattern, but it might not be the entire picture. So I think how you just described it is wonderful because now we're looking at, you know, assistive technology and what that might look like. So if I can pivot from there now and talk a little bit about why it's important to consider those five Ps. We, we love a good sort of, you know, um, mantra and what they are, but it's good to remember what they are. So the position paper, as we said, has people, products, provisioning, personnel, and policy. Why is it important to consider all of those, those factors? Look, uh, excellent question. And what was really fascinating was getting to the uh, the World Health Organization in Geneva, uh, going to the main assembly area and seeing all this diverse, eclectic, global audience come together to try and wrestle with some of these questions and, and wrestle with what's going on. And I, I'm a very visual person. Maybe that's, you know, the local map really appealed to me. But uh, jokes aside, I, I, I work with images and pictures. And so the WHO has put a fantastic graphic out now to describe it. And so what they've done is originally, so the person, which is the people paper, is the yeah. people we're working with. Yeah. And so they're front and centre in this circle, which is always the way it yeah, should be. Um, that's where we start. And uh, metaphorically, we imagine this stool and the stool has got the assistive technology sitting on top of it. It's like a black box yeah. and it's got five legs and the five legs are the people yeah. and then it's the personnel, which is the professionals around the person. Yeah. Within personnel, though, there's training, there's registration, there's adequate qualifications and things like that. Yeah. Provision, so, you know, how the, the AT might get to the person, uh, the policies. And, you know, I'm, I would rather I would rather do many things than read policy, to be fair. Uh, I used to work in standards <laughs> testing and I can go to sleep pretty quickly when I read a standards document. Um, but, you know, if we don't have the right policy in front of us, yeah. it actually doesn't facilitate any of the things we've done before. You can have the APA and OT Australia and the Australian Rehabilitation and Assistive Technology Association putting out all the right people with the right training, and if the policy doesn't exist, well, then you're, you're still not any closer getting to where you need to get to. And then, of course, the focus I was on was with the products. But metaphorically, if we imagine that as a stool with the AT sitting on top of it and those five Ps being legs, you take away one leg, and what happens? The AT falls off and the stool unbalances. And I think that was a really, really good wow. mental image for me to have in mind that even though I was in my area, yeah. we all connected. yeah. And, and we need to all be connected to make sure that we can all get the AT to the person and the people that need it most. And then the last thing that we all recognised, and it wasn't part of the P, so we're calling it the sixth unofficial P, <laughs> and it's uh, the place. So uh, going back to what we talked about before, am I in the pub? Am I in the classroom? Am I in the bedroom with my partner? Yeah. Um, you know, 
the context is extremely important for the assistive device as well. Mm. So six P's now, we just added another yeah. P. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, my, one of the things I really took away from the paper, David, was, um, you know, we, we are on this podcast champions for consumer involvement and um, the, the paper really highlighted that co-design with consumers was, was ideal in terms of uh, inventing and developing assistive technology. Could you just talk to us a little bit about how that kind of works in practice? Absolutely. I'm, I'm a passionate co-design advocate and I think it's the only way to go. Um, I've been told that I'm unusual as an engineer thinking that way, but I think my time at Navita Children's Services where I was the engineer, but I was always part of a team with a physio and a yeah. speechy and a psychologist and an OT and we all work together with the person that we were working with. It's just it's just the way to do things. Mm. Um Interestingly, if you talk to industrial designers, very, very good industrial designers who might work in this space, they're, their first comment is, well, of course, we work with the person. And I like that because, yeah. again, in their training, they've understood it's a person first. Um, so we developed it for our, uh, my PhD project. We had children with cerebral palsy at the heart of what we're doing, and they were taking away gaming systems and using them at home in the pilot phases. We were also working with children who didn't have cerebral palsy but who were the same age to get an idea of what they would think of the system as well. Mm. And uh, I'm running a couple of projects here at Flinders University at the moment. And again, we're using this co-design philosophy. Uh, there are colleagues of mine that talk about a hierarchy of co-design. Yep. Um, I like to think of it that with the intimate to the looping process while we're piloting and prototyping to make sure things are right. Yep. Um, at, an, at other levels, you could have uh, end users, as sometimes they're referred to, um, providing direction on research. So we should be working in this space yeah. or uh, giving input, being on advisory boards. But I actually prefer it when they're in it as well. Mm, uh, yeah. So they're in it and they're, and they're on the journey. And all the children I've worked with who have cerebral palsy, mainly the population I work with, have all loved it and they've been so amazingly articulate about what they do and don't like. We put a product in front of them or we ask them things and they're more than happy to give you the feedback. <laughs> it's usually very honest feedback as well, which is exactly what you do want when you're developing something. Yeah, exactly right. So we ran some focus trials for my PhD with the school uh, to try and get children who do not have cerebral palsy uh, just feedback on the game. So are our games okay? Do you like them? Because we know you probably play games a lot. Yeah. And I had a mother call me and she said, um, I'm replying to your consent form and my son's very eager to come along. Excellent. Excellent. It's fantastic. She says, but I'm calling you because I need to explain. He can give you some very forthright information soon. And he told me he can't wait to tell you how much your games might be bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I just thought, I said, look, that's fantastic. I've got three children and, you know, they really do just tell you they, they don't filter. And that's fine because we can take it and it's going to make right. the product better at the end that's of the day. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's knowing what the overall purpose is. It's not about us and it's the process. And yeah. that's why I think talking about the now six Ps is, is so vital for us. And when we're thinking about how we're going to prescribe equipment or assistive technology, you know, you do need to think about each of those elements because mm -hmm. there is otherwise a potential for wastage, isn't there? Because if you, you know, if you're going to prescribe something that's not actually going to be used but sounds really good, that could be a real, real big issue. So unfortunately, there is a whole area and it's quite well documented in the literature, but I'm not as close to it as I have been with other areas. And that is around technology abandonment. Yeah. And technology abandonment is a real thing. And I know in my previous life when I worked at Navita Children's Services in the Navita Tech area, there was technology that was developed and for whatever reason, it wasn't used. Um, and so, yeah, you can look at it on a lot of levels, Dana, from, mm. from waste, yep. uh, if it's public funds, to yep. just disappointing uh, all the time and effort that technicians and specialists go into to prescribe and assess and make sure it's right, right and then it's just not used. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just highlights again the importance of that framework. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And I suppose you used a phrase too or you used part of a phrase, but it's that great phrase that comes from the disability sector and that's nothing about us without us. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. It's always good to bring it back down to that, isn't it? So I guess that yeah. really relates into, you know, we, in, when we talk about using technology, there's now like the three A's uh, that, you know, we've, we've sort of coined around and, and, and spoken about. So there's access, there's affordability and availability. Now, if we layer that above the, the six P's, what does that mean? How, how does that work? Yeah, look, that's great. So, yeah, we have the six Ps now. And then it actually came out of that first forum in 2017 in Geneva. We were talking about the Ps. And then it, I think on day two, someone's like, actually, do you know what? It doesn't matter where you come from. So we've got specialists from the US and Canada and Australia and lots of developing countries representation here. 
They said, it's actually the three A's. It's the access to the technology. So can I actually have it come to me? And, you know, we know this. If I live in Adelaide compared to, say, if I live in Sejuna or if I live in Perth compared to, you know, Broome. Uh, so can the can the device actually get to me? Yeah. Uh, and what's the extra cost to me to get to me? Mm -hmm. uh, is it affordable? And, of course, affordability means different things in many different places depending on the cost of living and things like that. Mm -hmm. So just because it's there and just because it can get to you doesn't mean to say that you might actually have access to it from an affordability perspective. Yeah. And then the availability. So can it get to me? How long will it take to get to me? But if my therapist or my team working with me doesn't know the device exists, they can't actually recommend that I look into it. And yeah. so who knows about the device? So yeah. um, the six P's and the three A's, I think they actually go hand in hand. So maybe it's the PARS or something <laughs> like that. I like that. I think we we love these and they help us to remember lots of facts really, really quickly. I guess, Ash, this now that sort of brings us into the next component where we can start to talk a little bit about the work that you've done. And when we talk about awareness, let's talk about the gaming system now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and David, maybe you could start by um, telling us a little bit about gaming more broadly and, and this idea around serious games and, and what they are and what that means. Uh, for, for children with cerebral palsy? Absolutely. So gaming, obviously, most of us, I don't want to say everyone, but have probably grown up playing computer games from Commodore 64s to Ataris to, to you name it, lots of nodding. Yes, Absolutely. we will do. I ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I ask that question of almost everyone when I give a seminar. And it's great because we can all then have a common understanding. Um, and so a serious game, for me, my first mental image was actually John McEnroe uh, saying, you can't be serious. <laughs> um, but we actually are in serious games games are actually uh, a defined industry term and yeah. it represents any computer game where it's not played just for entertainment purposes and so if you have games for education games for management games for leadership training and games for health then you're working in the serious games environment and that's what we ended up doing with my PhD working in serious games so trying to break down those barriers where we can try and have the game motivate encourage and then enthuse the person that they're working with to do the same similar or identical actions that we want them to do where it would be therapy. And as we know, sometimes, and I'm a culprit here too, you get given exercises and that's work. Mm. Um, and, you know, we try and avoid work. So why don't we gamify? And there's another term as well. Why don't we gamify their, mm. their health or gamify their therapy? And so as long as you can get that coupling, I suppose this is the important part. We know what the therapist wants to achieve. Can the thing in the middle, we call the serious game, actually achieve those goals? And if it can, we can call it a serious game and we can work together. I love that idea that, um, you know, because we, we talk a lot about dosage and uh, oftentimes, yes. you know, the, the dosage of a particular uh, therapy or intervention that a child might need to, to see some positive outcomes isn't necessarily um, achievable because there is that uh, barrier in terms of the motivation or, you know, the, the, um, the mundane you know, types of exercises that they're, they're having to do to, to see that benefit. So um, I just had a, a little, I suppose, an additional question around serious games in that do they have to be games that are, I suppose, purpose built for the um, purpose of therapy or are they, could they be kind of off the shelf games that could be adapted for therapeutic purposes? Look, that's an excellent question. It's really good because it goes to the heart of serious gaming. So the traditional way has been to grab a game off the shelf or commercially available games and to then implement it in a therapy setting. Mm -hmm. And the classic ones I can explain are that are uh, uh, using the Wii gaming system with yep. the Wii nunchuck yep. and you might be doing temp and bowling. Why? Because you're doing these sort of actions with bowling or tennis um, yep. or skiing or anything like that. And so... That is where you're taking a game, but it might not be right. Yeah. It might not give you the actions you really want to get. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, unless you keep a stopwatch nearby, you're actually getting no metrics out of that game as well. So you're just, the only dosage you're getting is time. Whereas if you craft the game from the beginning, if you craft it with a co-design approach with a team that's saying, we want them to do this and this, and here's how we're going to encourage them to get to the next level. Within that, you can actually build in a whole lot of dialoguing, which is what we did. So you can then analyze any part of the game and any aspect of it as well. So, But, of course, there's a cost trade-off. I can buy a game for, what, less than $100, yeah. or I can pay someone to put 50, 60, 120 hours into a game, but it's going to be completely curated to what I want. And so mm, it's this yeah. trade-off. 
Yeah, it's quite a balance really, isn't there? Because even when you look at current gaming systems, and I would absolutely agree, the Nintendo Wii came out and I think every therapist, everyone went, oh, this is wonderful. You've got balance. You can do all of these things. But there are still issues, like you said, with, you know, the actual purpose. Are you repeating the the right kind of practice? But there's also things with accessibility as well, isn't there, in terms of the, the, the shape of the controller and things like that? Oh, Dana, I love it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so this is uh, so when I give a presentation, uh, we talk about the fact that the controller can actually be the biggest implement or the biggest impediment to yeah. the process because if you can't use the controller, then you can't get access to the game. And that's why we went down the custom gaming path with our Orbi gaming system, made the Orbi controller so it doesn't require fine motor control, dexterity issues, finger coordination. You can just mm. put your hands on the controller and rotate it around. And that was the primary aim. So we used universal design and that co-design approach to get that just right. And uh, and then, again, that's why sometimes off-the-shelf games haven't been appropriate because even those little tiny buttons on the Nintendo Wii or the Xbox controller, yeah. uh, someone post-stroke, someone with arthritis, uh, a child with cerebral palsy, it makes it almost impossible to use sometimes. And frustrating. Like It's not something that they would find enjoyable, which is uh, probably a big reason why we'd go down this path. Yeah. Exactly right. I call it the two C's and the D, the control, the coordination, and the dexterity issues, and they do cause frustration, absolutely. And you want your clients or the people you work with to be happy. You want yeah. them to be so motivated, yep. you know, uh, the engagement, and hence, as you said, Ash, the dosage. You want the dosage to be as high as possible. And so if you've got these little barriers or problems, it just won't be used as much. So, David, I, I watched your TED Talk and I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, explain to our listeners a little bit more about the, the Orbit gaming system and, and what the advantages of using a system like that are and, you know, who can use it and, and what the results you saw were. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Ash. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I tell you what, it was uh, so much practice and rehearsal to uh, spend uh, you <laughs> know bet. so many minutes on the uh, on the red carpet uh, under the spotlights. Uh, it was a, a wonderful experience. Um, I would encourage anyone out there who gets invited or asked to do a thing. It really helps you condense and coalesce your thinking into a, a package. Yeah. Um, so, so the Orbit Gaming System was a co-design system we developed to help children with cerebral palsy engage in computer gaming. Uh, and I suppose the assumption is there is that it's independently operable or usable by any child with cerebral palsy that we were targeting. So we were looking at children as young as five, uh, up to 15 years old. It was a home-based delivery system, so we didn't want to pull them into a clinic or a hospital. We wanted them to be able to use it anytime they wanted there at home. Wonderful. And if, if you say, yeah, it was great, it tapped into lots of different areas we were trying to look at. And if you look at it, it's got no buttons on it, and that's the primary thing. We know buttons can be problematic, so you just place your hands on it and off you go. Um, Mm. Because it was underpinned by universal design principles and co-design, that controller has now not just been a part of my PhD looking at children with CP, but we've used it in a post-stroke recovery unit here in Adelaide uh, with no changes because the controller was fine. Uh, Adults with arthritis and hand impairments, and most recently, and we're just about to start this trial in two weeks, uh, people with Parkinson's disease and possible Parkinsonian tremor as well. Wow. Um, so, um, so it's been really, really um, adopted. And uh, I have to say, extracting it from some of the homes of the children in my PhD trial was not easy. Oh, I've been for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. Um, so, yeah, six weeks in the home and sometimes getting it back was a bit difficult. Um, and so that's why, and, and I love the words we're using before, um, as an engineer, the, the goal of research, I think, is not just to prove efficacy and evidence, but as an engineer, it's about translation. Yeah. Uh, if we don't do what we do or if we do do what we do and do it well, our goal and aim should be to get it out there as well. So yeah. that, that commercial pathway is very important. So you had some really interesting results, but you had things that went beyond just the motor results as well. And I'm really keen to hear what they are because I think they're really important to consider, aren't they? Look, absolutely. One of the, um, so I learned a lot of things when I was on my Fulbright, which was good, good because uh, that was a fantastic experience. But I was working with a group and uh, in Philadelphia at the um, hospital over in Philadelphia, uh, the Shriners Hospitals for Children. And oh, yes. the research group there was uh, really amazing and really helped get my head in the right area because they said, look, you might be going into your research to do one thing, but, you know, the ripple effect, be, be cautious that you might actually pick up on other things. And so mm-hmm. you need to assess and capture those or else they go missing. And so while the aim was to develop this bi-manual device, which children with CP could use in the home for six weeks, 
and it had force by manual use. So their hands always had to be on the controller because we had little sneaky sensors sitting in the controller mm-hmm. to monitor hand position. Um, I would pick up the controller afterwards. And uh, parents would tell me that they'd noticed an amazing increase in socialization between their child with cerebral palsy and their able-bodied sibling. And we believe that's because it was the first time there was this equal platform where it didn't matter what your ability was, Mm. all be broke down those barriers and you could play the computer gaming system. So there was a sudden competitiveness now. Mm. Now, I'm one of four. I've got an older sister, younger sister, younger brother. And when I was a child, the thing with you always had to beat your sibling, right? That's the number one game (laughs) of anything. Absolutely. Um, And so... Yeah, so this created that platform where they could compete and potentially it was the first time they could compete on an even playing field. Um, The uh, the most memorable story, though, that I have is I picked up a gaming system once and the mother told me that um, following the trial, uh, her son actually started to talk more. Wow. Um, This made me um, extremely uh, emotional at the time and it was actually still emotional last March when I was talking at the Australasian Academy about it as well Mm -hmm. because if I went into a trial trying to encourage a child to talk more I wouldn't have come up with a serious gaming system but what was happening was he was playing the gaming system and he was doing very well and all of our games had levels that you'd work through his sister was playing too because we had a guest profile for anyone to play the game as well but she couldn't achieve as well as he was achieving so he was guiding her through and telling her what to do and what to look out for and how to win in the game and it was that common gaming experience that then led him to be more verbal which um you know, it is amazing, uh, but it's those ripple effects. I think we need to be aware of all of our research will have flow on effects as well. Socialization, participation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, David, I think, you know, hearing all of that, our listeners would be really keen to know, you know, how can clinicians access this type of, you know, this specific type of assistive technology and that, that Orbit gaming system? Is it something that will be available in the future or...? Excellent question. Yes. So uh, we have actually licensed our intellectual property and our technology to Novita here in Adelaide, where I used to work. And so the technology division, Novita Tech, is now on a commercial pathway to release the next generation of the device, which is called Eyeball. And it is a lot lot more streamlined. Uh, It doesn't use a laptop like the Orbit gaming system did. And so it's gone through some further design iterations as well. And so it should hopefully be available for release in 2022. COVID-19 unfortunately stepped in and delayed a couple of things like it did with most things. Of course. And so we're looking to have a commercial device out there, yes. That's oh, so that's exciting. exciting. Yeah. yeah. You've heard it first here on Research oh, Work wow. Podcast. Wow, breaking news. <laughs> we <laughs> love right. that. Love that. Oh, I think there's so much excitement for the future and, and I know Ash and I just love hearing news like this and, and we're so glad that all our listeners get to hear it. Well, yeah. David, it's been wonderful to hear all of the developments that have been happening lately. It really is very exciting for all of us. This is the perfect segue now to head into our next section, which is a very popular section as everyone keeps Keeps telling us, and that is called Tell It to Ed. Ed is our producer. He doesn't have a background in child health, but he listens in on all of our conversations and usually has great questions to ask as well. A great opportunity to describe your research and the work that you do to someone that doesn't have a health background. So, David, take it away. You've got about 60 seconds. Okay, so technology is an enabler, and I think people should just see that technology can be that interface between the activity that people would like to do and the end goal. Technology, even as as an engineer, is not the be-all and end-all of everything. We need to recognise that technology has a role to work in with existing therapists and families, and working so closely with families as I have done in the past, I think, you know, the more we listen to parents the more we listen to children, the more we're going to have those devices and technologies that really actually fill that gap. And so, you know, co-design from the very, very beginning involving children and their voices and what you do, and hopefully that product at the end of the day is going to be just right. That's a wonderful summary. All right, Ed, do you have any questions? Uh, I say this every week, but uh, I always have lots and lots of questions. Um, A very little known fact about producer Ed is that he used to work for Nintendo. Well, so uh, he used to play them for a living and test them and do all sorts of things with wow. them. Wow. He talks about himself in the third and person. He talks about himself in the third person. So, yeah, how, how wonderful is Ed? <laughs> but on to my question. So um, I, I've been thinking about this, obviously, as we've been um, recording today's episode. And um, the Olympics are just around the corner and, and um, 
with the Olympics around the corner, then there's obviously the Paralympics. And I've been thinking about competitive gaming and you, you touched on this concept of um, people being able to compete um, at the same kind of level. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on on a, a, a video game Paralympics, I guess, is, is a, an, an ability to have esports for, for people who don't necessarily have the same level of dexterity as other people. So I'm, I'm wondering whether that has some, some legs to it. Oh, wow. Oh, Ed, Ed, you've surprised me. Um, <laughs> oh. That, that's awesome. I love it. Um, so your background's phenomenal. That's excellent. Uh, I, I love it because eSports is huge. Uh, there's so much uh, going on in eSports at the moment. And if you actually jump online, so we made the gaming system from a therapeutic perspective. So the, the gaming system was there to try and achieve the outcome, which was to improve hand and arm function and sensation in children with cerebral palsy. That's what we were trying to do. Um, but if you jump online, there's many examples of uh, people who are, are very involved where they use their mouth and, and tongue clicks and tongue mobility yeah. to literally compete virtually online at a level where I'm sure the people who are playing virtually in wherever they are, be it Denmark or Minneapolis, have no idea they're playing against a user who's using switches and clicks and that sort of thing because the output, their avatar moving through the game, is just what you'd expect from, yeah. you know, dare I say, an able-bodied wow. user. And so I think that's what is a fantastic opportunity here to have an e-games where we just become more inclusive. So rather than specifically e-games for people with disability, but just e-games and just encourage people who have the potential and the talent to compete because, you know what, I think they love it. Oh, oh, I feel so inspired right now. Same. <laughs> this is great. I hope um, <laughs> all these, you get credited with all these wonderful ideas you've had over the course of the podcast, Ed. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I'm going to set up a uh, tell it to Ed company <laughs> and monetize all of those ideas. So. <laughs> and put it all straight you, back you into research. Call, <laughs> that's right. You could call it Ed said. Oh, oh. Nice. I'm not giving you a cut though. <laughs> <laughs> As long as it goes to children's research, I'm yeah, happy. That's right. okay. We're really Deal. happy with that. I can do that. My goodness. Well, I have to say I am feeling like I'm on cloud nine. It's such an inspiring talk. Thank you so much for being on the show, David. Like it was just something that really is different to our world, but really intertwined. And I think we can do so much more to work together and there's a great future ahead. And for all those people who have been listening, remember the run sheet notes will be available on the website and researchworks.net. And if you want this recorded as part of your CPD requirements, there's also a form that you can fill out with your reflection notes as well. Well, so we can help you keep a record of your PD. So, yeah, def definitely head on to the website for more information. Yeah, and just to reiterate what Dana said there, David, I've enjoyed speaking with and listening to you so much today. So a huge thanks from me as well. Thank you so much, David. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Dana. Thanks, Ash. It's been an absolute joy to talk to you here from my office. Um, thank you very much for asking me and the great questions. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Well, we'll talk to you guys all again next time. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.